Hello and welcome back to our live coverage of the UN Climate Talks here in Cancun, Mexico. We've been with you for the last uh, three hours, so we're into our uh, last half hour now. I'm delighted to welcome uh, Virginia Young of the Wilderness Society in Australia and uh, Mariana Pavan, I hope I've got the pronunciation right, of um, IDESAM in Brazil. Uh, so Virginia, I'll ask you to, to start just by uh, letting our viewers know what, what, organisa what your organisation does. Well, in the, on the issue of climate change, we think it's important that everyone understand just uh, what an important role protecting and restoring our natural forests mm -hmm. could play in solving the climate problem. Yep. Um, many of your listeners might not know that about 20% of the greenhouse gas emissions annually actually comes from deforesting uh, forests in tropical countries. Mm -hmm. uh, there's also big emissions from logging and clearing forests in developed countries as well. So we're very much looking at what, how we can help the world make good decisions about protecting and restoring forests, indigenous peoples' rights, and, uh, and getting a good climate outcome and a good outcome for all the wildlife and all the other, mm -hmm. all the other things that we treasure forests for. Uh -huh. so. <laughs> and and Mariam, what, what do Ida Sam do? Uh, the Zam is a local NGO, we're uh -huh. based in Manaus, which is the main state of Amazonas in Brazil. And uh, we have three programs, which is climate change environmental services, protected areas, and man management of natural resources. Mm -hmm. I'm the coordinator of the climate change program, mm -hmm. and we deal mainly with RED issues. Mm -hmm. and, and, and RED is a, a package of policies here at, at the UN Climate Talks designed to prevent deforestation, is that yeah, right? Yeah, RED is one of the big deals here in uh -huh. Cancun, and stands for reducing emissions from deforestation and forest degradation which aims to be a mechanism to compensate countries and states and stakeholders mm -hmm. for protecting their forests. So we do uh, projects, uh, capacity building, political articulation, all of them around this issue. Okay. And Virginia, you said about 20% of emissions almost are down to deforestation. How much? How many? How much forests are we chopping down each year? Is kind of um, look, I, I, millions and millions of hectares uh -huh. are disappearing each year, but it's not just the forests that are disappearing. It's also the damage that's being done from some forms of logging. So mm -hmm. clear fell logging occurs not just in developing countries, but in countries like Canada and Australia. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's there's emissions. You know, forests make a contribution no matter whether they're in a rich country or a poor country and what one of the things we're trying to do is make sure that the rules are the same whether you're in a developing country or developed country and that the focus of those rules is on actually helping to reduce emissions and and protecting and restoring the world's forests that sounds simple but in fact it's extremely hard uh -huh. and the interests of the big industrial logging companies actually tend to dominate mm -hmm. in these forums mm -hmm. so for developed countries the new rules that are on the table are to actually allow an increase in logging emissions mm -hmm. in the next through to 2017 mm -hmm. and to not have those count towards developed country targets, mm -hmm. which is really a huge loophole mm -hmm. for logging interests. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the things we're fighting against. Mm -hmm. And for developing countries, there's a much better framework being set up, but still there's a real question mark over whether or not the money that will go to developing countries to protect their forests will end up protecting them and not just subsidising logging interests to go in and log forests that might not otherwise have been logged. There's really big questions over whether the rights of Indigenous people will be protected through RED. Um, and there are big questions over how we can all verify the emissions reductions, whether they're in a developed country like Australia mm -hmm. or a developing country like Brazil. There's mm -hmm. a, a, some, some really big issues being dealt with here. And it's important to know that it's not just about climate change, is it? Because I imagine a lot of our viewers might not be sure on climate change, or maybe they don't know the science, or maybe they're sceptical and, and don't yeah. don't believe it. But for it, why why else are forests important? What like what what the communities that you work with in, in Brazil? Um, why are forests important to them? Right. I think here that in these COPs, uh, people tend to look at forests as just a bunch of carbon, mm -hmm. and that's all they talk about and care. Mm -hmm. But uh, I live in a city that's right in the middle of the Amazon. Mm -hmm. 
And I think carbon is just a small part of what it is. It has a huge, as Regina said, it has a huge impact on climate. But if you look at it uh, as far as as a whole, it is a house, first of all, for in the Amazon we have like 40 million people living uh, in the forest, like indigenous people, traditional communities. And apart from these people that have their for the forest as their houses, you have a lot of people that depend on forests for natural resources, for food and all. And it is a prov uh, provider for many other environmental services, mm -hmm. like water, biodiversity. If, you, if we're talking about specifically the Amazon, the Amazon is sort of a water, giant water pump mm -hmm. that gets water from the ocean and sends it a little to New York, a little back to Argentina. Mm -hmm. So it's just like this huge rain mm -hmm. production, pretty much. Mm -hmm. And it, it has a, a inestimable impact on, on a lot of other environmental services like cultural value, spiritual values for many communities, water, biodiversity, soil, insects, and we can go on for many other. Forests are actually the centers of evolution mm -hmm. on Earth. So they're a fundamental part of our life support system. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's very interesting. One of the things that's been presented here at some of the, the sort of side events that they have is pulling together all the science that shows that the more uh, natural a system is, mm -hmm. the longer the carbon is stored in it, the more resilient mm -hmm. the, the, the system is, the more permanence you get around the carbon. So there's actually a really direct link between protecting biodiversity mm -hmm. in a natural forest and getting then the best carbon mm -hmm. outcome. And that's one of the things that's really poorly understood mm -hmm. in these talks, that, that science has not been well um, taken up mm -hmm. by a lot of the negotiators here who mm -hmm. tend to think of, um, oh yes, we'll protect carbon and oh, if there happens to be some biodiversity benefits, well that's another, you know, kind of tick, a co-benefit if you uh -huh. like, but in fact it's core uh -huh. to getting a good outcome. And one of the biggest problems is there's no differentiation in these UN processes between a plantation, a yes. monoculture, and a natural forest. Mm -hmm. And it's a problem with the definition of a forest. Mm -hmm. We think of plantations as an agricultural tree crop, mm -hmm. so it's agriculture, and a forest is a natural system. Mm -hmm. And because there's no differentiation, there's um, uh, the possibility mm -hmm. that under RED, and already under the, the rules for developed countries, that you'll be able to convert a natural forest to a plantation which will be bad for the climate and bad for biodiversity and bad for a lot of local communities as well who, as you say, actually live in those forests. A lot of their livelihood comes from the forests uh, and converting them into a fairly sterile monoculture of trees mm -hmm. is a bad outcome all round. So there are those kinds of perverse Mm -hmm. potential outcomes that we're fighting against here. So, so is that a real risk then that we've come to these UN climate talks and, and we're trying to um, kind of deal with this huge problem of deforestation not only because um, of the, the carbon dioxide that it releases into the atmosphere but also because of the, um, the, the, the biodiversity problems, the fact that there's you know, vast numbers of animals being made extinct every every year and, and whole communities, you said 40 million just in the Amazon living, living in, in forests. So we've come here to try and solve this issue and now there's this set of policies on the table and, and there's the risk that it could actually make it worse, that we could aggravate the, the problem by um, not differentiating between natural forests and plantations. That sounds like a, a big worry. Uh, how, you know, is, is, that, is that really a possibility that we get to the end of this week and that isn't, isn't kind of solved? Well, I, I think it's a big worry. I mean, there are, in the current text on RED, there are meant to be some safeguards to help prevent conversion to plantations and to create incentives mm -hmm. for people to actually protect, in particular, forests that are relatively undisturbed. Mm -hmm. um, that where we are right now in the negotiations is the language that's in there is fairly weak mm -hmm. and needs to be strengthened. Mm -hmm. So uh, we're certainly trying to push um, the negotiators here mm -hmm. in that direction to not just strengthen the biodiversity and climate outcomes, but also a whole range of outcomes in relation to indigenous rights as well and community rights mm -hmm. to actually have a say in what happens to their forests. Because the reality is that a lot of communities living in their forests are actually protecting mm -hmm. the biodiversity and the carbon stock, and that's not well recognised yet 
in this dialogue. So there are a lot of intertwined issues mm -hmm. um, that almost require an education process for the negotiators. It's, mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's, you know, it, people come in with blinkers and just looking at the carbon mm -hmm. and then because of the commercial interests that are here, particularly the big logging interests and some of the, the big economic uses, um, there's a lot of mythology that, you know, logging's either carbon neutral or, God help us, actually good for climate change. Mm -hmm. And so getting the science into, um, to be well understood by negotiators is actually a big problem. And, and what are the, the drivers of deforestation in, in the Amazon? Um, because talking to um, a young delegate from Togo earlier today, he said that actually one of the main drivers is, is um, the use of charcoal um, by local communities. And in that context, it, it, it's a real difficulty for, for people in that country because you don't want to deprive people of an energy source. Um, is it the same in the Amazon or is it mainly industrial logging that's, that's causing the problems? Well, when you think about deforestation, you, you need to think about in a range of actors and and drivers and people but we, making it quite simple we can say that what actually drives deforestation is an economic mm -hmm. aspect people don't go cutting trees because they're stupid or because they don't like forests or anything they do it because they need uh, for example local communities sometimes need money sometimes need resources from the forest and today in the Amazon if you have a piece of land with forest you're not getting any money out of it. Uh, but if you cut all the trees, uh, deforest, burn your land and put some cattle or plant some soya, you do get a lot, a lot of money. So the drivers in the Amazon is, is like a bunch of actors that act in a sequence mm -hmm. as we don't have a lot of like governance of forests and huge amount of lands that just there's no police or anything. Mm -hmm. People that just go there, deforest some land, put cattle, put soya, and then it starts a cycle of using land for other uses that are not forest. So one of the main objectives of RED is to make forests worth for their value, just because they're standing. Mm -hmm. And by standing there providing, as I've mentioned before, a home, environmental services, they help in the climate. Mm -hmm. And, and this is what it is. So uh, if in Brazil, for example, you have a lot of also perverse policies that happened in years before. For example, in some years ago, if you had a piece of land with forest, you were considering to be, this forest, this land was considered to be useless because mm -hmm. you had a piece of land, but you were doing nothing to it. Mm -hmm. So you had to deforest, you have to put some cows in there or build a house or something to prove that you were doing something with this land. So it's a combination of a lot of factors and this is what we're trying to achieve, like to create a mechanism that countries that are taking this effort that recognize the important role that forests have mm -hmm. and are taking effort and investing money mm -hmm. actually to keep this forest standing, get some compensation, some financial compensation to be providing a service to the whole world, like mm -hmm. taking uh, uh, the climate equilibrium, water, biodiversity and all the others. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, if you see me pattering away at my computer, I promise it's not that I'm checking Facebook. This is an um, interactive show and uh, people can send in their messages. So um, if you're watching, you can send in your uh, comments via Twitter using the hashtag OneClimate or uh, on our comments box. Um, and I've just noticed that uh, a comment has come in and it said, um, if, if, if with the text that we have at the moment on forests, if that was to be put into effect, um, what would we expect to see, like qualitatively and, and quantitatively? Um, you know, would, would we see forest um, uh, deforestation stop or would we see it slow down would we, would we see um, in, you know indigenous people being chucked off the land as, as as we stand at the moment kind of what where are we at well, for developed countries we're in a really bad place mm -hmm. we'd actually see an increase in emissions mm -hmm. from logging in developed countries mm -hmm. of between 450 and 500 million tons mm -hmm. um, over the period 2012 to 2017. We'd also see the, one of the current loopholes in the rules for developed countries, um, which allows um, huge emissions from the destruction of peatlands. Mm -hmm. That's about a 500 million tonne loophole already. We wouldn't see that fixed. Mm -hmm. So we'd see a billion tonnes of greenhouse gas emissions not counted mm -hmm. in what's called the next commitment period, the period between 2012 and 2017. So that's a huge loophole. Mm -hmm. We'd 
we basically see developed countries let off the hook mm -hmm. for an increase in emissions. So for a country like Australia, which has set a really you know, low target of only 5% emissions reduction through to 2020, mm -hmm. um, it would mean their effective target was about 1%. So it's a really big impact for you know for other countries it's more impact and some less but that's something we're really fighting very strongly against here is to not see these really bad rules for forests and land in developed countries um, put through at this meeting because we think there's a danger it not just is it bad in developed countries and bad for the climate but it's also something that if I was in a developing country, I'd look at those rules and think, well, why have one rule for Australia and America and Canada and Europe and a different rule for Indonesia and Papua New Guinea and Brazil and, you know, Africa? Uh, so there's a fundamental question of equity here mm -hmm. and really what are what have always been very bad rules in the Kyoto Protocol around developed countries' forests need to be fixed, not made worse. Mm -hmm. And what's on the table at the moment makes them worse. Mm -hmm. The situation with developing countries through the track that in here that's dealing with that is not, it's not down to the stage of rules, mm -hmm. it's in a higher level mm -hmm. and some of the principles look reasonable. They need to be tightened up, they need to be stronger safeguards, if you like, around indigenous rights, biodiversity, not converting forests to plantations, those kind of safeguards need to be much stronger. But when it comes down, when it becomes time to do the rules, and it's not time at this meeting, then any rules that get up for developed countries, there's a danger that if they're transferred to developing countries, a red might not work at all. Right. If all you're doing is letting people say, here's our business as usual emissions and we don't have to make any reduction, mm -hmm. it's pointless. The whole thing will become pointless. So it's a really important time mm -hmm. for the world's forests and the climate. It's a critical time. So just to respond to uh, another comment that's come in, uh, it says so much of Borneo has been converted into agricultural forests for palm oil production to be used in cheap ingredients in consumer products. Uh, orangutan species in serious trouble because of the specific situation. Um, it's a good point that the people are selling their land to industry to make money to survive, not because they're bad people. Do you think people taking actions like not purchasing products with palm oil in them help send industry a message about maintaining biodiversity? So is there something that people at home can do which is going to influence you know, rates of deforestation? Absolutely. I think anyone should be very cautious about any product with palm oil in it, any product. I mean, the whole um, challenge, mm -hmm. one of the big challenges here, is the conversion mm -hmm. of forests for biofuel crops. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, I think it's tragic. Some of the buses here have got signs on, you know, 10 million hectares of detrofa planted as a biofuel crop, I don't know where that's been planted, over what kind of land, you know, was this some, was this agricultural land, uh, that has this taken food from communities, has it destroyed forest, and part of the problem with the current rules for developed countries is there's um, no differentiation, like Germany is proposing mm -hmm. to shorten the logging rotations mm -hmm. in a lot of its forests so they can put in biofuel trees mm -hmm. and burn those trees in power stations. Now, unless the rules are fixed, they'll be able to do that without counting all of the emissions from the forest or the emissions from burning the trees. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's absolute nonsense. So people need to be very cautious mm -hmm. around what kind of biofuel you know, palm oil has by and large been established over um, existing forest. That's actually climate negative. Okay. Taking the carbon that's safely stored or relatively safely stored in a natural forest, bulldozing that, not counting the emissions from that and then putting in a palm oil plantation is not a climate solution. It actually adds to the problem. It increases emissions. I just have a comment on that that I think we should be, I totally agree with you, but I think we should also let clear that biofuels and legal and sustainable logging, when done right yes. with the safeguards yes. and in according to the mm -hmm. law, 
they are actually a powerful tool to fight climate change because mm -hmm. if you are like managing your forest and extracting wood in a sustainable way mm -hmm. it actually helps decreasing the pressure over natural forest the same with biofuels mm -hmm. so when they're done in, in lands that were not forest or they were not deforest to it they are also helping climate so when when people say about biofuels and logging yeah we should be careful on how it happens because it's not all legal all logging and all biofuels that are the bad guys some of them are good guys too it's very hard for consumers to work to tell the difference and so a great deal of caution i think needs to be exercised for instance in my country um, the, the biofuel industry is touted as a replacement mm -hmm. to basically native forest wood chipping for paper. And that's been a very destructive um, part of forest management in Australia for several decades. And we don't want to see you know, one form of destruction of forests replaced by another. Um, we're going to have so to. It's, a, it's an interesting challenge, this we're, one. We're going to have yeah. to leave the conversation there. It's a really yeah. interesting uh, chatting to you both, and thank you so much. It's been a, a good uh, a good day in terms of our coverage of forestry. <laughs> That's good. Um, and we didn't get bumped by Daryl Hannah. Oh, either. not quite. <laughs> <laughs> but you have just given away our next guest. That's not a bad thing. Um, we're going to be back in a couple of minutes with uh, Daryl Hannah. Uh, we'll be back in a couple of minutes with Daryl Hannah. Um, we're going to go to a video now whilst we get her seated. <laughs> thank you. Thank you.